Reem's mouth with all this bloody... Hello everyone and welcome to today's video. I was riding in the car the other day and I had the ABC News Radio on and I was met by this very interesting debate and it was what was going on in the Australian Senate at the time, which was Wednesday, I'm pretty sure Wednesday the 23rd. Anyway, the debate was around changes to legislation, around um, what is being taught in schools in Australia, what is permitted, permissible, what is not, what is acceptable, what is not. And I wanted to just share with you some of the things that were shown and broadcast in that actual Senate hearing. And I'm going to give you a bit of Pauline Hanson. She is opposed to a lot of the teachings that are happening in the public schools in, in Australia today. Teaching around gender, race, climate, and things like that. So I'll, I'll, I'll touch a little bit on hers towards the end of her speech. And then we'll move into what I find is what very interesting about the whole thing. We'll listen to another guy because he gives a pretty scathing um, rebuke of the Greens and the and their policies. But I want you to focus and listen to the arguments made by those who are in favor of all these things, who are in favor of teaching children about sexuality from an early age, teaching them about critical race theory and things like that. Listen to the response that they give to any sort of opposition or challenge to their narrative about what can and cannot be taught in Australian schools, what the minds of children are absorbing in Australian schools. So I'll begin with Pauline Hanson, and then I'll just stop along the way to make comments, and then hopefully you can listen, and you can get an idea of what the Australian taxpayer is paying for. These are the debates that are happening. These are the debates that need to happen. But there are people in positions of power who, in my view, are reckless, who are disingenuous, who are not able to speak for themselves as well. But we'll listen. This is a bit of Paul enhancement, and then we'll move into Maureen Faruqi and then a few others. rubbish that they're pushing about gender fluidity and identity and LGBTIQ and 39 plus, I don't know how many there is, I can't believe it, um, how many um, sexual identities they want to um, impose on people, but that the bottom, at the end of the day, we are male, we are female, we both play our own roles in our society and that's who we are. Let the children grow up, let them decide their own sexual preference, uh, whether it's or whatever they want, at an age. Don't even put them under the knife for this castration of destroying their bodies. That's allowed. And if you speak out against that, you actually can be taken into court or fined. Well, that's a ridiculous point as well. Children, let them be children. Parents, you know, grow up yourselves and be parents and take responsibility yeah. for, your, for your own children and what they're taught. And if you know, don't like what they're being taught, then go and visit the schools and the teachers and the principals and have your say. Yeah. Yeah. Senator Faruqi, you have the call. Uh, thank you, Acting um, Deputy President. I rise to speak to the Australian Education Legislation Amendment prohibiting the Indoctrination of Children's Bill 2020. And I will keep my remarks brief because we have already wasted enough time on this disgraceful bill. Senator Hanson, honestly, give it a rest. You are making a fool of yourself. And you are, what you are Senator doing Faruqi, is despicable. Senator Faruqi, through me, please, through me, let's keep yes. the debate respectful. Through you, Chair. Senator Hanson first introduced this legislation back in 2020. The Senate inquired into it then, and its conclusion didn't leave, leave room for any interpretation. The committee said it was poorly drafted, vague, inconsistent. In short, it is bad legislation. But in addition to being bad legislation in a technical sense, this bill is just vile. It is transphobic. It is anti-science. It is an attempt to force a rewrite of the curriculum to require teaching of climate denialism and harmful 
outdated ideas of gender and sexuality. In the dying days of the Scott Morrison government, the then education minister shamefully also took a leaf out of Pauline Hanson's One Nation playbook and started waging offensive, pathetic, toxic history and culture wars. You know what one of my favorite things about the 2022 election is? And there are many. One of my favorite things about the 2022 election is that along with the coalition, the 2022 election has rendered Senator Hansen and One Nation irrelevant. Like the coalition, Senator Hansen has failed to self-reflect on why One Nation has become irrelevant. And I'll save her the time. They are irrelevant because their racist, divisive politics are there for everyone to see. And if you need evidence, just look around in this chamber or the other chamber. Both places are more progressive and more diverse than ever before. Senator Hansen is irrelevant because the Australian public realizes that it's not immigrants that are making their life hard. The Australian public realizes it's not trans people that are making their life hard. It's not climate science that make, that's making their life hard. It's not First Nations people that are making their life hard. It is unscrupulous big corporations, fossil fuel giants, billionaires, and far-right politicians like One Nations sitting here that are making their life hard. Going back to the bill, the bill amends the Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority Act 2008 to require ACARA to ensure the school education, that school education provides what Senator Hansen considers a balanced presentation of opposing views on political, historical, and scientific issues. It also amends the Australian Education Act 2013 to make financial assistance to states and territories conditional on them prohibiting what Senator Hansen calls indoctrination in schools. Such complete rubbish. Students should be encouraged to think critically and they should be exposed to diverse viewpoints and perspectives. But that's not what this bill seeks to do. This bill is a vile, unsubtle, blatant attempt to force schools to spread ridiculous and cooked One Nation beliefs, which would harm trans and gender diverse students and introduce anti-science concepts into classrooms around the country. And Just for context, Senator Hansen gave a statistic from the census, census that there were only 1,200 Australians who identified as trans. And she made the point that there's a lot of changes to the school curriculum that is trying to accommodate such a small number of people. But in the process, we run the risk of spreading ideas that are arguably harmful for, for young people, setting them up for a great confusion and a great debate or a great question in their minds, well before their ability to, to function and to reason as well as they could if they were uh, mature, is what am I? Who am I? Am I a man or am I a woman? Am I a boy or am I a girl? These are very uh, fundamental questions that should not be asked by young people because it should be apparent who they are and what they are. So I think this risk that is um, suggested by Faruqi is inflated. and not be able to tell people in this country the history of how violent settlement took place and how we need to reconcile with that history. All trans people and children want is the right to live their lives with respect and dignity, to be who they are like other people are able to do in this country. The restoring of this bill is a sad reflection that after all this time, Senator Hansen remains a peddler of sad and hateful politics inside and outside this chamber, spreading ignorant prejudices. This bill 
and Senator Hansen's outdated hateful views should be comprehensively rejected by the parliament. They should both go in the bin. It's vital that every child learns the realities of the climate crisis, the truth of Australia's settler colonial past, and how to have respectful relationships in context of comprehensive sex education. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Acting uh, President. Um, just see if I can. Deputy President, yes. Just. Yes, thank you. Um, this is the uh, reintroduction of a bill that Senator Hanson introduced uh, two years ago. At that time, Labor opposed uh, this bill, and the bill does not support evidence-based teaching. There remains a question of uh, constitutionality and uh, Commonwealth uh, overreach. Acting uh, Deputy, uh, sorry, Deputy President, the version of the curriculum signed off by the former government in this April this year supports evidence-based teaching of literacy and numeracy. The bill that has been presented to the Senate today does not do anything to enhance the teaching or learning of the foundational skills parents want for their children. At the time of the initial introduction of the then Department of Education, Skills and Employment uh, made a submission to the Senate Education Employment Legislation Committee as part of the committee's inquiry into the bill. The department submission detailed the operational challenges posed if the bill were to be enacted, citing lack of clarity about core issues, potential legal risks and overreach by the Commonwealth in directing the way that states and territories provide education to students. <clears throat> and I quote from the conclusion of the department's uh, submission. The broad scope of the amendment set out in the bill and the limited definition of key terms presents several issues. The submission then goes on to say, and I quote, the requirements of the bill may present unintended consequences. The Senate committee, chaired by uh, Senator McGrath at the time, went on to recommend that the Senate does not pass the bill. Doing so, the committee report uh, says, the committee is concerned that the lack of specificity in the bill could increase the risks of legal challenges and may result in unintended consequences in areas beyond the original intent. <coughs> the committee is also concerned that the bill would result in significant uh, overreach by the uh, Commonwealth Government into the day-to-day -day operations of schools which, under constitutional arrangements, are the responsibility of the states and the territories. Deputy President, uh, we would prefer that the Senate spend its time doing useful work rather than reconsidering a bill that has already been found to present significant legal and operational issues. Senator Ullman Payne. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak on the Australian Education Legislation Amendment prohibiting the indoctrination of Children Bill 2020. I feel like I'm uniquely placed to speak to this bill. I've been a state secondary school teacher for nearly 30 years. I started out my career as a health and physical education teacher, and I also taught sexuality, human relationships, uh, and sexual education. I'm also qualified to teach secondary school science, as well as humanities. When I left the department, I was a head of humanities and languages. This bill seeks to put restraints 
on what teachers of health and physical education and sexual education, science and humanities can teach in their classes. It's not about balance, it's about hate and propaganda. We, as teachers, teach to the curriculum that we are provided. It is a curriculum that is grounded in truth and science. We don't cherry pick the bits of science that we agree with or disagree with. We don't cherry pick the bits of history that we like and are hard to face. And we don't discriminate against the children who are in front of us in our classes. During this debate, I've watched people on the other side of the chamber laughing when we've spoken about education around students' gender. I invite you to come into a school and sit in front of a student who has made several attempts on their life because they have been subject to hate and transphobia. How dare you use our young people as political footballs? They are not wanting anything except to be accepted for who they are. I know this is emotional on both sides, but this would be the emotional argument behind why we should make drastic changes in terms of how we teach gender and sexuality in schools with the vision and idea that by teaching it all, it's going to lead to some reduction in harm, reduction in bullying, reduction in suicide rates for young people. But the fact that this person goes straight to that point, screaming and yelling, is a reflection of a kind of politics that doesn't get to the heart of what things are all about. It bypasses logic, it bypasses reasoning, and goes straight to the emotional argument about a teacher and a student and their relationship. And let's continue. We teach a curriculum that is grounded in human rights and science. Young people are generous of spirit, they are accepting of others, and they care about the planet and their future. They are critical thinkers and they are problem solvers, and they deserve an education that is grounded in truth and justice and human rights. They deserve an education that is grounded in science. It is not teachers in schools who are attempting to indoctrinate our young people. A profession that works hard to give every young person in this country the positive future that they deserve. It is the people on the other side of this chamber who are seeking to indoctrinate their hateful and bigoted views in our schools. I will not. I don't think that's accurate. I think the idea is just to not teach about progressive sexuality and things like that in schools rather than imposing some kind of teaching brought down from the state. It's just refraining from teaching about sexuality and indoctrinating young people. So I don't think she's quite correct in what she's saying. Subject young people in this country to your bigotry and hate. I will stand up every time I see it and the Greens will call it out. This bill isn't about critical thinking. This bill is about legislating a far-right curriculum and individual senators and parties interfering in what is taught in our schools instead of leaving it to the education experts is a very slippery slope. 
In the US, we see some states banning teachers from teaching about racism or sexuality, and some are even banning books. This bill is... If the book banning is anything like I've seen, the book banning is mainly banning books that are inappropriate for students and for young people. You have that case in movies where you have a rating system that shows what is appropriate for young people and what is not. And the same should be applied to, to books. And if some books are deemed inappropriate, I don't think it is that out of the question to say that book is particularly banned at a particular public school for these reasons. But I think the issue is conflated with censorship or freedom of speech to suggest that books are being banned en masse. Um, but if these ideas are being taught in a space that is not age appropriate, then I think there is room for parents to say, we don't want that book to be taught in our schools because it's inappropriate. And I think she's conflating that again. Now, in America, I grew up in the public school system in America. We learned about racism. We learned about human rights and we learned about the history of slavery. That's always been a part of the program. The change that is happening now is critical race theory is what is being taught. And there's a lot of parents who have said it's inappropriate and it's not what we want to teach our children. And that is what the mix up is, I would say. Bill is dangerous. And as a teacher with over 30 years experience in our schools, it is an injustice to the young people in our schools and it is an insult to teachers. Thank you, Senator Orman Payne. Senator Antic. Um, thank you, Madam, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak uh, in relation to the Australian Education Legislation Amendment uh, prohibiting the indoctrination of children bill 2020. And I have occasionally taken the opportunity uh, in this building to explore how far the capture of government departments by leftist ideology has gone. Um, in this place, we see all the time that top health bureaucrats can't tell you what a woman is, they can't tell you whether a man can get pregnant or not. It's actually quite surreal coming into this place sometimes, but sadly, it's, it's not just our health department that's controlled by radical leftism. Australia's education system is another domain in which common sense and Australian values are under attack. The education system, of course, has always been of vital importance to the so-called progressively progressive revolutionary idea. The radical left understands that for people to accept their absurd ideas and their ideology, that they're obsessed with power structures and group identity based on race, class, sex, religion, and that they have to indoctrinate children from an early age. To, this, to them, this is the purpose that schooling serves. This institutional capture of the education system by leftist, socialist, intersectional ideology has been devastating to the social well-being of this country. And I'd argue to the lives of young people in general who are tragically more depressed and more worried about the future than they ever have been before. As I've said before, we failed to instill in our young people a sense of meaning, purpose and understanding of their great heritage. And it's wrong that Australian children are denied the genuine opportunity to meaningful, meaningfully study our past and learn from its wisdom. We've seen Australian British history virtually removed from the curriculum in recent times, and wherever it's presented, it's done so with a sense of... I also want to point out the issue that a lot of people who will present these policies, who present these ideas that they consider to be fact, do not... Well, they've had the benefit of the Australian curriculum as it has been. They have had an education that has led to them being able to become politicians, to become leaders, to spend 30 years in the education system. But they want to propose a new system and a new curriculum for, the, for others. And I think it's unfair. They want to propose something that they didn't experience themselves with this idea that it's going to be better. Yet they stand in positions of power, being elected officials on very good money, as products of a system where there was no teaching about critical race theory, where human sexuality was left for parents to teach. But then they're proposing that this is going to be a better way.
to young people, and they've never experienced this kind of teaching themselves. Sense of shame and a sense of regret. Um, it's, it's almost as though Australians ought to be ashamed of our great British heritage, which brought us philosophy, literature, religion, a justice system, and all the other benefits that European civilization brought to this country. And yes, of course, there are tragedy and sometimes even cruelty associated with colonialization, but to guilt trip Australian students into believing that their heritage is a racist one is simply cruel and unjust and untrue, and it's a terrible thing to do to our next generation. Australian students are being denied a true and balanced understanding of their history and false, in favour of a false ideological vi vision designed to portray anything that is European as inherently racist and evil. This couldn't be further from the truth. It's because, our Christian because of our Christian heritage that we have the concept of social justice at all. And it's because of our, our Christian heritage uh, that the notion, this notion which ended slavery in Britain that all people are made in the image of God regardless of their race, gender or class. Now, when this bill states that political, historical and scientific issues must be taught in a balanced manner, I take it to mean that the task of teaching is to be done without seeking to indoctrinate our children into a rev revolutionary worldview. Um, and I see it as being uh, not trying to present them with this ideology, but rather presenting them with arguments and counter-arguments, teaching students to rely on reason and evidence. In other words, that students are taught how, not what to think. And of course, the, the, the views of resentful revolutionaries can't stand in such an environment because they're not true. They don't hold up when the evidence is presented or when students are actually allowed to think without being guilt-tripped. It's not, a, it's not only the history cur curriculum that's affected. Schools have regrettably become a vehicle for so-called sexual liberation ideology. And again, the left understands that to overcome the stigma associated with their views, they must normalise concepts like gender identity from a very young age. The reason that the left must nor normalise untrue concepts as early as possible is so that they, they can interfere with what children would otherwise learn from their more sensible parents. The left don't respect the authority of parents to pass on traditional common sense beliefs to their children, nor do they view education as a journey of becoming disciplined, competent, flourishing individuals who want to contribute to their society. Instead, to them, schools have become mere training grounds for political indoctrination and the building of a voter demographic for years to come. Now, I've collated seven different complaints from concerned parents around South Australia about what their children are learning in public and, in some cases, private schools. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, there are so many more, but here are just a few. Number one, my nine-year-old daughter attends an eastern suburbs primary school, and the other day the kids learned all about sex with boys in the class. Seriously. Number two, my daughter was in class, year seven eastern suburbs school, and a teacher played the ABC's BTN behind the news, which always tells them to live in a state of alarm. On one occasion, the presenter suggested the kids should protest for BLM. They should protest for climate change against misogyny and everything in between and finish off by protesting at the dinner table, if you don't mind. Protest. Activism. I have a suggestion. It's called education. That's what our taxes pay for. Do this out of school hours. Number three, why should I put my kids in a place where they are taught to hate themselves and see the world through a depressing lens. I never imagined I'd pull my kids out of school. Something is very sick in our children and youth. Someone needs to do something. I'm a mum, number four, I'm a mum with a daughter in year nine at a Christian school here in South Australia. She was in class last, last term and the teacher started talking about anal sex. My daughter was so uncomfortable. Then the teacher said that the students could face each other and ask any question they liked. How is my daughter meant to feel safe? You are teaching kids that there are no boundaries in discussions. What has this topic got to do with education? My daughter didn't feel safe. Her dignity as a young person was not respected. Unacceptable. Number five, my daughter was in a small Catholic school. The grade two teacher asked the kids to draw female and male body parts. She refused to do this activity. If my daughter was at a friend's place or an uncle's, I would be horrified. I pulled my kids out of those schools. Number six, my son was asked to lie down on the ground and imagine he had breasts and female genitalia. Number seven, my son was asked to write an essay imagining that he was a girl. Pointless, woke, rubbish. The education in this system has been taken over by radical leftist revolutionaries like the storming of the Bastille. Your children are being indoctrinated, not educated, and parents in this country need to wake up. Thank you, Senator Antic. Senator Pratt. 
In today's contribution to this debate, I simply want to put the words of Georgie Stone on the record because they are, as a young person, they're far more relevant to this debate than my own views. So I delivered this speech on her behalf. She's an incredible young woman, an Australian actress, writer and trans... Okay. This is leading up to the magnum opus. If you've listened to this far, well done. I know it's long, I know it's drawn out, and it's about to get worse. Because Louise Pratt is, no offence, no disrespect men, meant, but she is a bore. And she's about to tell you, rather than giving her own advice, as an adult in society, as a leader in society, instead of giving her own advice about what is sensible, based on her years of experience, she's going to share with you and read to you the written speech by a person who is young. And I know there is something to be said for personal experience, and I totally get that. But at the same time, this is a young person who has not had this, um, the life experience that these people have, and Louise Pratt is going to just read it verbatim what she has to say. Now, I wish I could skip forward, but I, I can to this point. I want you to read it, or listen, and... Just get a sense of what it's like for politics in Australia. I ask myself, how did this person get voted in? I'm sure she has some some qualities, but on this occasion, um, uninspiring. Louise Pratt. <coughs> Pardon me. Leading up to the fin finale of the Greens debate and discussion in Australian politics today. Here goes. Transgender rights advocate. She says, my name is Georgie. I'm a proud 22 year old transgender woman from Melbourne. I'm here in Canberra to host a screening of my short documentary, The Dream Life of Georgie Stone. As part of a delegation of families Doctors, Transcend Australia, the Gender Centre, LGBTIQ Health Australia and other members of our trans community. My documentary, directed by the incredible Maya Newell, I believe is the perfect catalyst for a trip to Parliament House to invite you to not only stand in solidarity but actively support one of the most vulnerable and marginalised communities in Australia, trans kids. When I was a kid, my favourite thing to do was to play with my brother Harry in the backyard or in the park near our house. Harry and I would run excitedly into the bushes pretending we were escaping into a fantasy world and going on adventures. Sometimes we'd rope our parents into our games or even our poor old dog Roxy. As I started primary school, these adventures became even more important to me. I didn't realise how appealing a fantasy world would look compared to the one I was living in. As a young trans girl, I... This is very symbolic. The fantasy world possibly is continuing with this idea that a man can be born in the wrong body. I grew up being taught that there was something wrong with me. From the bullying I endured at my first primary school to that same school refusing to support my transition to having to go to the Family Court of Australia three times to access medical treatment. I have spent years trying to convince adults that I was who I said I was, and that my gender identity wasn't a fantasy or a game. I spent years carrying out, carrying, sorry, other people's fears and doubts, 
expected to prioritise their feelings and well-being over my own. I spent years scared of growing up because the trans woman I saw in movies and shows were always portrayed as leading tragic lives. Whenever I watched the news, I would see trans kids being used as a political football, weaponized and dehumanized to generate fear and panic in the community. And all sides of politics can be complicit in this. Surely when people say, let kids be kids, this is not what they mean. There were, however, some key factors that helped me get through the darkest of times. The first is that I had a beautiful, supportive family around me. I always knew that no matter what happened at school, I could always come home safe and feel loved. My family were a constant source of strength and love when I was struggling. In circumstances when I couldn't fight for myself, they stepped in and advocated for me. The second was access to gender affirming care. Going to the gender service at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne was integral to my health and well-being. I met doctors who were compassionate and listened without judgment. Doctors who knew how to look after me. The medical sector can be frustrating and a sometimes dangerous place for trans people. So access to specialised care is vital. Access to family support services can make all the difference for trans kids. Yet these organisations are severely underfunded Australia-wide. This impacts the work they do and limits the access to the support they provide. Most organisations are run at a gra grassroots level by volunteers and they are self-funded. But we can't do this alone anymore. Without proper funding, vulnerable children are falling through the cracks. Trans youth are much more likely to suffer from mental health issues such as depression or anxiety. Trans people between 14 and 25 are 15 times more likely to attempt suicide. This is not because we're trans. We're not the problem. The problem is marginalisation, a lack of family support, lack of access to gender affirming health care and threats of violence and harassment. All the world's a problem, but I'm not. It's all you, you people, you people are the problem. How's that productive? How is that even true? I don't think so. Which is why we need your help. An urgent boost in funding for specialist family support services will better equip them in supporting families of trans kids. The more support trans kids and their families have access to, the further we can reduce the risk factors that are contributing to the prevalence of mental health issues impacting trans youth. With family support behind me and access to gender affirming health care, I was finally able to look to the future and to not be afraid. As I entered my late teens, I was excited by the prospect of not just surviving, but of thriving. That's all I've ever wanted, not to be doubted or shunned, not to be bullied or attacked, not to be weaponized or feared, just to live, just to live happily and safely, to go to school and focus on learning, to be ambitious and excited for the future, to have agency over my own life, to love and to be loved. I think back to myself as a child and my heart aches for her. I wish I didn't have to spend so much of my childhood fighting for my rights. I wish that when I played with my brother, it wasn't laced with escapism and longing. 
I wish I didn't spend so much time trying to make myself smaller for other people's comfort. The solution was really quite simple. If adults truly listened to me and I was able to be myself, then I could have just lived my life. The trauma I've experienced in my life didn't happen because I'm trans. It sprouted from other people's fear and ignorance. Every roadblock and pothole I've encountered on the road to adulthood hasn't been of my own making. Trans people are not the problem. And with you... It's very arrogant to hear this language, to place the burden of responsibility upon everyone else. It's just bizarre to hear it said because if anyone else under any other circumstances was to suggest that all of their problems were as a result of someone else, they would be lambasted. They would be um, run out of town for not telling the truth. But here in Australian um, politics, this idea is espoused and spread. Your help. I have hope for the future that the next generation of kids won't have to fight so hard that they can just live. The road ahead is treacherous for families of trans kids, but it doesn't have to be. Together, we can pave a safe one for those yet to come. Thank you, Georgie. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Rennick. Thanks, uh, Acting Deputy uh, Madam President. And I rise to speak to this bill today, and I have to be honest, I haven't even read the bill. Um, and I don't really want to be talking about it. But in regards to um, some of the comments, I just want to... Uh, beg your pardon? Order, Senators. Yeah, sorry, can you not interject, please? Like, you know, do you mind? This is a chamber. There's rules and things. Order, hey? Senators. So, Senator Rennick, please You haven't heard what I said yet. So just could you please, with, you know, could you please stop interjecting? OK, I, I just, you know, look... I, you know, some of the comments in here about hatred and all of that, you know, are just, just, it's just totally unfounded. There seems to be a big missing ingredient here in terms of um, transgender children, and that is the role of the parent. Now, I've got children, if they have issues about their sexuality, and I've said this before, I will deal with it with a properly trained psychologist outside of the school hours. Now, with the greatest of respect to teachers, and I have great respect for teachers, they've got enough on their plate um, they're not necessarily qualified or trained to deal with issues because this is not just about sexuality. This is obviously about uh, the way they feel and the parents need to have a role in this. And when this becomes, you know, something that's dealt with in the school without the actual parents having any um, oversight of what's going on, that's when, in my view, this becomes an issue because I strongly believe in the role of parents. I'm a parent myself. So... Um, you know, and as I said before, rightly, teachers often follow the curriculum, but the point is that a lot of this curriculum is actually made from bureaucrats who, you know, work in government circles. So it is a government issue. Um, personally, I'd be much happier if teachers didn't have the bureaucrats in the curriculum telling them what to do and let teachers actually deal with the students because they are the ones who know how to deal with the students the best. Um, they know the student, they'll know the parent, uh, and I'd rather keep the bureaucrats and the curriculum right out of it altogether, um, which is why, you know, uh, I, I think, um, I, and, I, and I accept the comments over there before, because teachers are, are told to follow the curriculum, and I don't like that. I think, you know, because I, most teachers I know genuinely have the interests of the child at heart, um, but I, I believe that education is a three-way thing. It's between the teacher, the parent and the child, and it's very important that the parent has interaction with the teacher as well as the children uh, so that parents know what's going on. Uh, just in reply to one of those other comments that we have to teach them climate science, I disagree with that remark as well. We have to teach them science. Uh, and that involves all sp aspects of science, including mathematics, uh, which underpins a lot of science. So to say that we teach them climate science when most of it's actually based on modelling and not based on the traditional methods of uh, cause and effect and demonstrating cause and effect and quantifying cause and effect. Um, I know myself when I've had to, you know, dig out my textbooks, my own school textbooks when dealing with climate science, it's actually, the science of heat is actually called thermodynamics. 
uh, you know, you deal with quantum uh, mechanics uh, with the photons, which comes from the sun. So to teach them all about climate science and how the world's going to suddenly, you know, overheat by two degrees in the next 10 years without actually teaching them the foundations of basic science, of basic mathematics, etc., etc., is a very dangerous thing. So that's why we've got to come back to the basics. Uh, and I'm not having a go, maybe that's in the curriculum. I haven't read it. And, and I'll just touch on one other thing. Uh, you know, I, I've often been criticised that I'm in no position to talk about the Bureau of Meteorology and their record keeping and what would I know because I'm not a science scientist. Well, that just goes to show how the, the, the slogan science is used way too often. Uh, in um, you know to justify the, any any argument because at the end of the day taking a temperature measurement and recording that data is actually record keeping it's got nothing to do with science it is simply about recording the temperature storing that um, and then not going back and changing it a hundred years later because it doesn't suit your agenda uh, and now as you know the Bureau of Meteorology just admitted in this recent round of estimates they've got four different data sets. Uh, well, you know, and um, they've homogenised these, the three. They've got the raw data set, which rarely ever gets reported anymore. So long, long story short, some of, the, some of the, the comments in here today, I think, have uh, tried to um, politicise the very thing that they think that, uh, you know, that the bill is trying to do. Quite frankly, I, I, I want ideology out, out of um, education altogether, whether it's right wing or left wing. I, I don't really care. I just want children to be children, uh, and I want the, the, the primacy of the parent to remain in their upbringing, and it's the relationship between the parent, the child, and the teacher that matters the most. And that's something that I, I just, I, you know, I was an older father and I took a couple of years off to stay at home. And I, and this is why I really believe in, you know, ideally having a stay at home parent, because I know when I used to go up and pick the child, my, my children up from school, you know, and I saw the teacher, not every day, but often you'd see them at three o'clock. Uh, you know, if you ever had an issue, you could just speak to them informally about it. You got to know other parents uh, of the children in the class. Um, yeah, you got to go drinking with some of them. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's so, so, you know, at the end of the day, I, I don't want education to be something where it's, it's pushed down from above by the bureaucrats, many of whom, you know, who do have um, agendas or, or, you know, preset ideology. I want children to be children. I want the, the primacy of the family um, and the interaction of the community uh, both in, you know, and I, I went up and I read to children. My wife still goes up. She's, uh, and I'll give a shout out to Story Dogs. Um, that's where basically you take your dog uh, into the classroom. Uh, so a big shout out to Rocket. Um, she loves that. And, and it basically helps children, um, uh, you know, feel comfortable because they've got a pet there. So, you know, and it's that community. I mean, and, and I should acknowledge my own father who was uh, PNC, uh, chair of the kindergarten PNC for about four years. And then he was chair of the state high school in Chinchilla. Uh, there for about another seven years. And it's very, very important to have your community uh, be heavily involved um, with, with education. Likewise with fates, um, with tuck shops, all of those type of things. Of course, your PNC meetings. I was myself for a short time uh, president of uh, my own uh, son's PNC, uh, school, PNC there. Um, and that's, that's, that's why I wanted to speak today. I mean, as I said, I'm not interested in the bill because it's all about, you know, well, I am to the extent that I want it. I want the bureaucrats and I want government out of education and I want education to be a grassroots thing where it's driven by the love of both the teachers to their children and I know teachers become very fond of their children. I have great memories of my own teachers um, and I should, should also acknowledge, um, you know, my great great aunt who uh, um, got a Bachelor of Arts in 1920 from University of Queensland and she went on to teach uh, maths and physics at All Hallows. Uh, in, in Brisbane and has now uh, now got the hall named after him. She taught maths and physics up till 70. My own grandmother, um, my great aunt's niece, who got a Bachelor of Arts in 1930, she went on to be a teacher. She taught before the war and after the war. Um, and of course, my own aunt, uh, who also uh, is, is, was a teacher, uh, became a librarian. And unbeknownst to me, when I went to University of Queensland, I was actually a fourth generation graduate of University of Queensland um, and it's only realised later on that uh, they are all women above me uh, who got a degree and unlike my grandfather who taught maths in the public service exam in New South Wales in 1911, he went back to be a farmer. So I'll just throw that in. So education is very important but it has to be driven by you know individual needs of the students um, 
and 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 you know I think that's what matters. So you know the sentiment of the bill that you know I just want government out of our everyday lives, and I want family and communities and grassroots measures to be to, to look after our children because every child is is precious and every ch child is an individual and that you know and this is one of the things why you know i'm very proud to be an lmp because it's the dignity and worth of every individual and it's the family values uh that the family is the basis of all things here and that is why um i don't want any of this talk and we're all doing this for hate and we've got political agendas i have no political agenda i want i want politics right out of raising my children. I want them to have the best childhood they can without the toxicity of politics. And I even say to the young LNP people, you know, uh, kids in the young LNP, I tell them, don't get in the uh, young LNP. I said, do yourself a favour and go and listen to Pink Floyd's 1973 Dark Side of the Moon album, where it says 10 years gone and no one had told me when the starting gun had happened. Even, even in your 20s, I don't want you being involved in politics. You know, when you're, when you're in your 20s, go out and, you know, get, get, get drunk, uh, you know, get get, you know, do, you know, get to understand women better, uh, get rich, travel the world. I mean, these are the things, you know, come back to politics when you're in your 40s and you've, you've lived a life and you can actually throw yourself into it. Um, and I guess that's the thing, you know, it's this slow creep of government, uh, whether it's education or, you know, whatever it is, it's like we just want government out of our lives and we want the innocent, you know, the innocence of childhood to stay just like it is. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Steeljohn. Thank you. Uh, Here we go. This is the final moment. This is the last speech, and then we're cutting it, cutting it off. But this is the one that I hope gives you a sense of where some politicians are at in Australia, where they... I, it just boggles my mind that we have to pay for some of these things. Maybe it's the cost of democracy. Maybe it's the cost of balance in, in uh, democracy where you have people on different sides of the spectrum. But this is what we pay for, and this is what people have elected. So here we go. Jordan Steele John. In con it, was, it was not my intention to contribute to, uh, to this debate. Um, not only because of the fantastic contributions already made uh, by uh, my colleague, Senator Faruqi, a proud uh, woman of colour. Um, not only uh, that, but also the fantastic contribution of my uh, con colleague, Senator Alman Payne, who has been a teacher uh, for 30 years and is probably more qualified than anybody in this building to refute the absolute nonsense that has been scraped together in this piece of legislation. Um, but I, I have been moved to speak to this bill as a young person and as the Greens mental health spokesperson because of the content of some of these contributions. Now let's be really clear what this is. This is a bill that has been brought before this chamber uh, by people who wish to uh, force uh, into community debate about some of the most important issues that can be discussed right now in our community, that is being discussed right now in our community. The role of race and power in this country. The deep and urgent need to support queer kids particularly trans kids in school in this country. These are conversations which our community are engaged with, which our community are grappling with, which people are expending extraordinary emotional labour, educating, informing, healing, helping people to gain new views, taking incredible amounts of time and energy in the process. And these people are coming in here to exploit those conversations for their own political gain. And the worst part of it is, the very worst part of it is, is that these people that have contributed to this conversation so far today, at their core and at their base, don't actually care about these conversations. They don't actually care about these issues. They are simply trying to get attention for themselves. 
And that is why I have sat here so resistant to contribute to this conversation, because these people outside of this chamber, if not by the internal machinations of their own party, wouldn't be considered fit to run a lemonade stand in this country, let alone be one of its political decision makers. And yet here they are right now. And they are making these contributions regardless of what they actually think, but because they see political opportunity in it. So they brought something f here dripping with hate, dripping with transphobia and racism. Well, let me tell you what the reality of transphobia and racism is in modern day Australia. 63% of trans kids report self-harm. 43% have attempted suicide. Have you any idea what it's like to sit with a friend or to look at them across the table and see the scars on their arms? Or to talk with their mum as they share with you what it is like to sit with their kid in a hospital, wondering whether they're going to pull through, or what it is like to sit in a room of people, some of the most marginalised, some of the most courageous human beings I have ever met, as they sit across from overwhelmingly old, white, rich blokes and once again, for what must feel like the millionth time, justify their right to exist as they are. And to ask for equal respect and treatment before the law of the community that they occupy. To have this chamber brought low to such purposes demeans it. This should be a space in which people work to support those courageous community conversations that are happening right now. This should be a place that works to support parents talking with their kids about concepts they might not have heard of before. It should be a place where we support communities to engage with the difficult conversations about the reality of our history, about the reality of what racism has done and is doing to communities across Australia. And instead, instead, we get this legislative filth, this legislative hate, contributed to by MPs who, before they made their contribution this afternoon, admitted they hadn't read the bill, didn't know the context, but just wanted to have a go anyway. Now, I will also say that particularly in relation to the racist elements of this bill, and this is a deeply racist piece of legislation, what is happening here is a bunch of people who have felt themselves, and indeed have been, dominant in the decision-making spaces of Australia since its foundation as a national entity are feeling just a little bit of pressure, a little bit of pushing to not be the centre of attention all of the time, to be the primary decision maker in every conversation, and are terrified that children in schools might now have the opportunity to learn the truth of our history, not only in relation to race, but also in relation to the role that misogyny has played in Australian history and still plays in Australian society. One of these senators made an example. He read to the chamber what he felt was an outrageous uh, case of wokeism. And it was a teacher inviting their students to imagine what it would be like to be a different gender than them to engage in a basic act 
of empathy. And yet these people, these men, come in here and denigrate empathy. They shame empathy. And in so doing, they reveal the hollowness of their own character. And it would be, you know, you'd be able to kind of write it off as this tiny little fraction of folks. But actuality and reality, these are the ones that are willing to say it out loud. These are the ones that are willing to put it on record. The sad shame of the moment is that in addition to these people, these people, there are many in this place who either share their views or are unwilling when they hear them to challenge them. And that is not okay. Because right now in our community, people are putting their bodies and minds on the line to challenge these narratives. And they have a lot less structural and institutional power than an MP. So I challenge anyone and everybody that would oppose this bill today to do so behind closed doors with your colleagues. And finally, because I am under no illusion, and I'm actually very thankful that there will not, I would imagine, be a single trans person in Australia, a single queer person in Australia. There'll be very few people of colour that would watch the contributions of these people from One Nation, uh, from the LNP, uh, from uh, whatever le is left of the Palmer Party, and, and see them as a point of reference. So go, oh, we'll engage with these intellectual discussions being made with these individuals. I don't think that that's very likely. But what I do think, what I do think is likely is that these hate-filled contributions make their way onto social media platforms guided by algorithms put together by corporations whose sole purpose is to make profit and they end up in front of the mums and dads and grandparents, particularly of trans kids. And so if any of those folks are watching along tonight, I want to bring you back to those statistics. 63% of trans kids and trans people have self-harmed. 43% attempted suicide. Now, if we look at prevention, what actually has a massive impact on reducing that figure is if that person has in their life one parent who supports them. The rate of suicide, the rate of self-harm plunges if they can identify somebody in their lives particularly a parent who loves them. So if you're watching these videos, if you've watched these contributions, if you're the parent to a wonderful, fantastic child who may be questioning their gender identity, who may have come fully and beautifully into a diverse gender identity, that may be experimenting and being part of those communities, embracing them with pride, then go and hug them and tell, you that you, tell them that you love them because that is one of the best things that you can do to keep them safe and happy. Know that your child is fantastic. And if you are a trans person, if you are a person of color, if you are anybody touched by this hate-filled filth, know that these are views that are not shared by the entirety of this chamber. And they are views which are actively and will be consistently opposed by the Greens every single step of the way. Have you finished, Senator Stildron? Yeah. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Thank you. That's the end, everyone. It's been a long video. I'm going to post this one up. Love to hear what your thoughts are. If you made it through the whole thing, well done. It's a lot to listen to. It's brain draining sometimes. But this gives you a sense of the place of Australian politics at this current time. You know, this is probably a reflection of not a mainstream stream issue, um, not hot topic 
at the moment. Um, but it's what happening. It's what happened. It's what ha what's it's what's happening in the chambers of Australian government. And these are the ideas people have. And I'd love to know what your thoughts are. Let's have a discussion. And thanks for your time. Have a good day. Bye bye.